the sound of his master's voice. I like our mess, don't you? Do you like our mess? Good evening, sir. Good evening. How are you doing? Pretty good, and how are you? 
Our weather does go up and down here in Tennessee at this time of year. Yeah. Yep. I think some people think it's uh, something else, but it's just normal. Yeah. What do others think it is? I think some people think it's global warming. Oh, yeah. Good evening. No, I don't believe it's that. It's just the. Have they the hey, did, did they take your chairs? Did they take your chairs away? What do you prefer, armrests? Yeah, I usually do. I'll just sit over here on the horse. Oh, good. Sarah and, and Natasha are not coming. <laughs> yeah. Hey, did you know about that? I think they can hurt Yes, what she called it? me. So well, how's she doing? She well, she was sick all day. But she was sick all day. What did they do to her? Well, I don't know that. Jim Brown, isn't it? It is. And I saw you, uh, do you have eggs uh, hatched on your place? Not hatched. <laughs> Just like. Okay. <laughs>
Gray mentioned that they're probably going to be, I think, a baptism at 6.30. Yeah. I mean, so, some, some uh, people were coming yeah. in and wanting to go, and I didn't know anything yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know who, but... Uh, uh, Hannah. Hannah. Whoever Hannah is. Oh, okay. Oh, how was your dad doing? He's doing better. So he's now doing it for some more work.
All right, we'll go ahead and get started here. I know it's a couple minutes late, but um, let me try to get the uh, announcements from the email <coughs> that was sent today. Uh, Patricia Binkley has been moved to Encompass Health for rehab and is improving. No calls or visitors at this time. Cards may be sent to her home address listed in the encouragement list below. Uh, Cheryl Allen, grandfather of Austin Thomas, is now residing in a care facility in Cookville. Uh, the Thomas family would appreciate prayers of peace and comfort for Mr. and Mrs. Allen as they transition into this phase of life. Uh, we continue to keep in our thoughts and prayers Bernie Adjant, Cynthia Bickle, uh, Doy and Rita Holman. Matt, are they progressing? Yes. Okay. My, my dad and I will do some yard work today. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's good. Uh, Jonathan and Haley Ferris, Sarah McLeod, Donna Neal, John Parker, Bill Price, Ruth Smith, Debbie Tumlin, and Stephen Vaughn. Um, let's see. March the 12th. Ah, that's Saturday, isn't it? Spring ahead. Spring ahead. Uh, move our clocks forward. Got that right? Yes. Move it forward. So we lose an hour of sleep um, this Saturday night. Grand Timers Fellowship Opportunity. Reserve your spot for the Sunday matinee performance of Arsenic and Old Lace. We will be traveling to the 54 Dinner Theater in Donaldson, April 23rd uh, at noon. The bus will leave after morning worship. Uh, the cost is $35, but will be discounted counted to 32 for groups over 15. Deadline to sign up is Wednesday, March 15th. That's next Wednesday. Forms are available at the Grand Timers sign-up station near the office. Or see Brother Lloyd. You've got all the details and more. Okay. Uh, let's see. Inner City Catfish Fundraising Dinner, March 30th and 31st, 6.30 p.m., Okay, that'd be the last, what, Thursday, Friday in, in the month? Mm -hmm. I believe that's right. Um, okay. And I'm seeing an Easter egg hunt Saturday, April 8th, 10.30 to 12. All right. Um, before we begin, let's uh, go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for watching over us and being with us. We thank you for bringing us here tonight that we can open your word and read it. We pray that you give us understanding and give us discernment and wisdom and help us to be able to see the things that you expected of your people in the past. And we pray that we understand how to apply these things to our lives and we pray that we can keep ourselves unspotted from the world and keep ourselves pure for you. We pray for those that we've mentioned tonight in our announcements. And we pray that you'll watch over them, bless them, and we pray that you will return them to good health and those who or in the community, we pray that they can be back with us worshiping as soon as possible. We thank you for all our many blessings. We thank you for the elders here, the deacons here, and the work that they do. And we pray that you give the elders wisdom and knowledge and foresight in the decision-making process of things that they come, things that come in front of them, each whether it's daily or weekly, and in the in the future. We pray that we do everything to your glory, and we pray that the things that we say and do here tonight are acceptable in your sight. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Well, we're going to pick up in chapter 21, uh, verse 15. Last week we stopped at verse 14. I hope to cover through about chapter 25 around verse 19. <clears throat> I'm going to be honest with you. We're not going to get every verse. We're not going to get every law. And um, what we're going to see here in this section are basically disputes um, and how uh, the laws of God governed the relationships of the people in the nation of Israel. And um, they could be grouped in, in different ways, uh, but we're going to see some of them. There's just going to be things that come up. It's like, how does that fit in? And um, I think maybe one way to look at it is when Moses was addressing the people, he might not have had it just laid out exactly everything he was going to say, when he was going to say it. And I wonder sometime if some of this wasn't more of, of he knew what he was going to say, but uh, he would say it, and then maybe there was another thought or something else came to his mind. So it's not just perfectly categorized, and it's not the way that uh, we might separate things out for, for a Bible lesson or a sermon or, or, or study it. Um, as we're just looking through it chapter by chapter and, and somewhat verse by verse. So um, we'll jump in and we'll start with uh, chapter 21, verses 15 through 18. And we're going to see here the inheritance or the rights of the firstborn. And this takes us back to thinking really about um, Jacob and Esau. And uh, so... But let's take a look. If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him children, and if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possessions as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as the firstborn in preference to the son of the unloved who is the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he is the first fruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. I don't know what version you're looking at. The love, the unloved wife, um, you might have the beloved or the hated and the hated. You might have the un loved and unloved. You might have favorite and disliked. Um, I think the idea there was not necessarily hated, but maybe loved less. That's what I was, I was looking up some things. Uh, when I think of um, Rachel and Leah mm -hmm. being the two wives, you know, he, he was tricked and he got Leah first and then Rachel and... Uh, I don't know that we could say probably that he didn't love both of them, but maybe maybe that's the idea of loving loving one less and not just hated the way we think of hate or dislike. Um, the idea I think here is the man couldn't just choose who got the the double portion, uh, the firstborn, whoever the firstborn was, that's who got the double portion there. Um, that double portion I found means a mouth of two, as in um, twice to uh, what one person would have, but he has in another as well. So a double portion of everything. Um, was trying to also think, let's see. So the idea being he can't just choose his favorite or pick his favorite. He's got to go with the firstborn of, of his and his wife's. Um, put it in a modern context, it simply says God's law is going to take precedence over my, pre over my preference. Mm -hmm. I can't. I decide I'd rather honor this child, but God said that's not the one. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I guess we could also think as well, you know, well, that wouldn't be an issue too much if he didn't have more than one wife. Yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you think, well, maybe, okay, that's something God allowed, but, you know, I'm, I guess you see it on TV. You'll see some TV show where a man's got three or four wives, and I'm thinking, how can anybody be happy in all that, especially the women? But anyway, Matt, yes. go ahead. Uh, a good principle of the Bible, of biblical interpretation that I've learned, is that description does not necessarily always equate to prescription. Right. Okay. Just, just because something is described in the Bible doesn't mean it's prescribed. In the Bible. Okay. Okay. All right. Got you on that. Uh, all right. Next we see in uh, verses eight, uh, verse 18, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of his city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And all Israel shall, he shall hear and fear. Um, A couple, I, a couple things here. When we, when we see the words glutton and a drunkard, um, it might not be necessarily what we think of a glutton as far as just someone who continually eats. Okay? And it doesn't have a, a, uh, necessarily that. But one who squanders, maybe, maybe a glutton for pleasure. And that's what that son lives for. Uh, in, in squandering his, his wealth, uh, possibly his inheritance. I can't help but think of possibly the prodigal son uh, who squandered his, he wanted his inheritance early, and yet, you know, news came back to the family that they had heard, or at least the, the rumors were, he, the type of riotous living he's going through. And then he eventually, he comes back and he wants forgiveness. He wants to be traded, ju treated just like one of the slaves, just as long as he can work and have something to eat and have something over his head at night. Um, many of the commentators mentioned here a, a squandering of your energy and of your flesh and just debauchery, basically ruining your life, just spending your life on on things that are only destructive to the point of you just waste your life. Um, it's interesting too here that they're to bring him to the elders, but yet the parents, you know, as we've read a couple weeks ago about you've got to have more than one witness who's seen something such as uh, someone who's worshiping an idol and you've got to bring them before uh, the elders and the priest, and they've got to they've got to judge, and then you take part in the in the stoning. Well, here the parents wouldn't do that. The parents wouldn't take part, but they would bring the child there. Um, I think that's interesting too to compare that to the prodigal son, and how we see that he came back and God accepted him or his father accepted him. Um, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of equating the two, but I, I really wonder, you know, how often did that happen in Israel where the parents brought a son like that? And, you know, I can't help but think we're, we're probably not talking, I, I don't know, I don't think we're talking 12, 13, 14 years old. I would think we're talking older than that. Um, I really didn't see anything on the ages that were mentioned. But um, anyway, the parents were not supposed to participate in that. Um, in Proverbs 19, 18, 
let me read, I found that for us in Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. And uh, it's interesting, too, because over here in Mark chapter 7, verse 20, And he said, what comes of a, let's see, did I get that right? Mark 7, 7 verse 10, I'm sorry. Mark 7 verse 10. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles your father or your mother must surely die. So Jesus is talking here and talking about what Moses said. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many things, many such things that you do. It's interesting that Jesus actually mentioned this. It was in the Old Testament. And... Um, I know you've seen a lot, and I know that the longer I live, I see a lot. And especially teaching, I see some things that are pretty unbelievable sometimes. And you think, we see it on TV as well. And there's a lot of things happening. Um, I don't know that I've told anybody in here this, but uh, the little girl a few weeks ago who uh, is at a volleyball match in St. Louis, that little girl played basketball for me, and um, she and her sister both. And, you know, just something, like seeing things like that, you know, and we see a verse in the Old Testament, and we can't help to think that that's extreme, and I'm sure people who have no real thought about the Bible think that's terrible. But then you think of all the things that we see, and it seems like younger and younger are the, are the basically children who are doing things. It's like you, we wouldn't even imagine adults doing, at least not when I was a kid. Um, and, and you think it's not only for the family, and you think it's not only God has these laws for Israel to keep them different, from all the nations around them, but yet, you know, it's, it's to keep the society together, it seems, too. These harsh laws and these, you know, that life is important mm -hmm. and, and it's respect for our parents and respect for people. It's important. It's almost it has to do with the foundation of society and, um, I don't know. I may just be talking too much and not have enough scripture to back up and just talking about my feelings or thoughts on that. But it, it seems like it's, we just see it in our world today. Things that we, we didn't ever think we'd see anything like that, especially out of the ages of, of people now, young, young people. And, um, you know, you see it, uh, well, you know, Christianity is always referred to as an inside out religion. Right, because the, as the Holy Spirit lives within you, Christ does his work within you through the Holy Spirit and, and changes you to a new creature from the inside out. And I used to think that was just Christianity and, and just a New Testament thing, but uh, there's you know, so many scriptures that talk about the heart, you know, and, and so the laws and the, the regulations and laws and things that the Israelites were going to do, uh, the purpose was supposed to be to change the heart. It was supposed to be to change them from the inside out, you know, and, but also as a people, too, right? And I think, you know, as Americans, we forget, and I'm just saying this because I, I realize I'm saying this, I've forgotten, that, that, you know, it's important to be a believer, but it's important to be a, a, a member of a community that's a believer, 
and to take care of other believers. But but there's, there's flaws. That, that was the main the problem, you know, with the we were talking about the younger, the prodigal son in the in the parable of the, what we call the parable of the prodigal son. But a lot of scholars will say when they talk about that that parable that it should be it should be called the, the prodigal of the two wayward sons. Because the older son, you know, he's equally as guilty as the younger son, because he doesn't want he doesn't want the father either. He just wants the father's stuff, right? And so, you know, he, there's no heart changed. He's done all the rules, and you know, and that's Jesus compares. That would have been the, you know the same comparison from the people that lived, you know, throughout the wilderness, that their hearts never changed. They were hard hearted. Mm -hmm. The older son's heart is hard-hearted, and the Pharisees' hearts are hard-hearted. You know, so but but there's you know the purpose in the in the separation of the people from the nations around them, the regulations and all those things are so that they they'll have a changed heart, and it just doesn't happen for some of them. For some of them, it does. Yeah. 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 Sorry. And that no, that's a good point too. At the 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 older brother. His heart wasn't right either, and we, you know, it's interesting because he wasn't happy that brother returned. Yeah. It was almost like, well, okay, he he took everything and now he's back. Yeah. Now he, what? He didn't want any community with his brother either. Right. He said, "This son of yours." Right? Yeah. 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 I wanted to point out that the older brother is the one who comes back with the report about riotous living. That's the only place we have that. Okay. He says, the son of yours has wasted his not, life. Not, on not, that bro not that brother of mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And so we don't know that that's necessarily true. Mm -hmm. The elder brother is the one who brings this report. He made the awful lot worse than he may have Okay. Wow. Okay. When we, were, when we were on our visit to Israel, I discovered why they did a lot of stoning. I've never seen so many rocks in them. <laughs> they had to do something with them, so they were the people. <laughs> they don't run out of ammunition, do they? Is that right? Okay. Well, I can't help but when you mention that, and, and the father says, and I, and I guess I ought to turn to it, but everything I have is yours. You know, it's like, it's all yours. I'm just still here. And the younger brother only got a third of what the father had. Because the older yeah. brother would get yeah. two thirds. Right, right. Okay. Um, we will continue. Um, a man hanged on a tree is cursed, beginning with verse 22. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Um, thinking about this, and I'm, I welcome your comments on this. In Galatians 3.13, um, let me turn over because I've got that one prepared. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Um, if I understand this right, the cursed man here, this, if he's done something punishable of death, he's committed a crime, He's not a curse because he's put on a tree. He's a curse because of what he's done, and then he's put on a tree. Yeah. And 
this is, I think, one of those things I thought I understood. I thought I understood it totally, but maybe I didn't. Um, but Christ took our sin in the same way. The things that we've done, we would be like that criminal who has transgressed. We violated God's law and we've sinned and our penalty should be death. But Christ, having not sinned and like us in human form and being tempted as we are tempted, without sinning, then as someone innocent and pure without sin was put to death, he takes all of ours because that's got to be the biggest social injustice ever, ever committed. That here's a perfect sinless person and you're going to put him on the cross. And then he's going to be seen humiliated. Well, even before his death, he was humiliated. But he bears our sins and we now shouldn't be afraid of God, but we should be happy and rejoicing in that because of Christ and what he did for us, we have forgiveness of sin and we have salvation. I hope I got all the details on right because I think there was a few things I had a little mixed up and maybe I didn't quite understand until I really started digging on this and about uh, being on the tree. And I, I think I had a couple of those ideas kind of mixed up myself. Um, any comments on that? Or Okay, well... Let's move on and let's take a look at chapter uh, 22. We're going to see just some various laws here. Uh, you shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. And if he does not live near you and you do not know who he is, you shall bring it home to your house. And it shall stay with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him, and you shall do the same with his donkey or with his garment or with any lost thing of your brother's which he loses and you find. You may not ignore it. You shall not, you shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the way and ignore them. You shall help him to lift them up again. Um, I guess I think when I see this and read this, this seems to be brotherly love, kindness, uh, compassion, and just being treated the way I'd want to be treated. Um, you know, I hope that if, if I had to take out my wallet and I didn't notice that a credit card or some bills or a bill fell out and I walked out of the room, I'm hoping somebody who saw it would flag me down and get it back to me instead of just waiting to see if I noticed and then since I didn't notice, just pocket it. Now, the reason I say that is I've seen a kid try to do that at school, so anyway, that's, that's one of those things. Um, and I think it was with a pencil or an eraser or something crazy. But anyway, finders, um, keepers. finders keepers, losers, weepers. That's right. Um, I think it's interesting. You don't hide yourself. You don't ignore it. Uh, the opportunity to do right, do right. Even if it's an inconvenience, take that animal home and feed it and don't let it die. And... If, you do, if the person lives too far from you and when you see them again or they come by or I guess word gets out that you've got the donkey, they can come get it. Um, I just think there's a, 
I don't know. That just hit me as being treated as you as I would want to be treated. Um, I don't know. I, I enjoy that. And plus, it says don't ignore it. Um, okay. Well, as I said, now for something completely different. Verse five: A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Um, you know, we see this in the news, if you can stand to watch the news anymore very long. Um, seems like it's almost every other night, if not every night. And um, again, read some interesting things. I guess there's a lot of different directions you could go. I remember years ago, um, you know, just a lot of issues in church as far as whether should a woman only wear a dress. I know my grandmother and my mother used to talk about that all the time, a long time ago. And um, it's interesting, some of the commentators mention these things and um, I, guess it, I guess in the big picture, um, you don't want to blur the lines and it seems like from what I did read and, and you know some of the garments back then it seems like the outer garments it seems like everybody would be pretty much covered up but maybe it's just the way they wore the garments um, but you know today it's not like that I mean I, I don't know about you but I, I'm sure you, you see things you go in a store or whatever you think I'm at the store, I'm at the beach. Where am I? I'm at the store, okay? Uh, but, you know, it, it's just, it's almost like people don't even think anything about what they wear as far as modesty, and I know this is not really talking about modesty, but anything that blurs the lines and I think confuses people, and I think if you've lived long enough and you see some things, it's like, what am I looking at? You know, it's like, and sometimes I kind of think that's, that's what part of this is about, but I um, also read, too, that in the, in the pagan nations, you know, with their religions, they had, they had male and female prostitutes, and they all different types of clothing they wore, and they dressed up both ways, and just, uh, you know, of course, God doesn't want that, and he didn't want his people like that. He doesn't want us like that today. Um, but you know at the at the very least it just causes cultural confusion at the very least I mean I, I look at you know I see things and I see kids around I, I, they see it and I'm thinking what in the world are they thinking because I think I, you know and, and I don't know but God doesn't want it let's put it like that we, we know that um, Matt, Matt, to say yeah, go ahead, Matt. Um, building off what you said about not going the lines, um, God is a God of distinctions. God makes distinctions between right and wrong. Uh, in Genesis 1, the first, that's the, the ultimate distinction in the Bible. God, the Creator, created the creation and the creature. So it's the Creator creature distinction. And also, uh, underneath that is the, the, the male-female distinction, and as you said, you know, God doesn't want the, the, the lines blurred or the, the distinctions blurred between uh, male and female, uh, and that, that also relates to homosexuality. That yeah. homosexuality blurs the lines. Yeah. yeah. And you know, he he wanted to keep his people totally away from that, and not to blur any lines, and not to be, not to even get involved or look like you're getting involved with that. And that's what he wants for us today. Um, but thank you, thank you, Matt. And in Romans 1, real quick, Romans 1 talks about uh, people worshiping the creation instead of the creator. Right. So there, Satan likes to invert things. Yeah. He likes to invert uh, worship uh, of the creation instead of, of the creator. He likes to blur the lines from male and female. He likes to blur the lines generally between right and wrong. And where God makes distinctions, we need to make sure we, we follow them also. Yeah. 
And like you said, people started worshiping the creature instead of the creator, yes. or what was created instead of the creator. And if they do that, all kinds of other distinctions yeah. will get blurred out. Yeah, because you've turned it upside down. Derivatively. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Right. No doubt. It's weird, though, that this part is off by itself, and then, but from all the other stuff about sexuality later in the chapter, you know, so it's kind of hard to figure out what exactly, you know, it's, it's just kind of in there. Yeah. And then, I mean, it, it, it kind of comes out of nowhere, and then it disappears for a while, and then, yeah. then it gets back into sexuality in, in, you know, six or seven verses. I well, that, that's what, and I mentioned, I guess I mentioned that tonight, um, you know, Moses is speaking to the people But, I, you know, I kind of wonder. I don't know that he really had it all structured, yeah. written out like, okay, we're going to cover family. Now we're going to cover uh, crime and punishment. Now we're going to cover, you know, what we're going to do with lost and found items. Right. You know, it seems, it makes, it makes me <laughs> wonder, you know, did, was, was he just talking? And then, who knows, maybe somebody said something. I, I don't know. Or maybe it's just something went, popped in his head and, Here's this, and because like you said, we're going to have another uh, in the next verse here, it, something different again. Yeah. There's not much, well, what do you call it, a smooth transition or flow from one thing to another. I also wonder a lot of times when you see things like this is that would the original audience have some context that we just don't have? I mean, I know you mentioned the pagan worship practices, which I guess is in some of the commentaries. But when they have heard that, they would have said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what he's talking about, you know, because we just don't have that information, whatever it was, or we don't have it with precision. You know? Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, then he gets into the bird nest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this is, I really enjoy this, too. Uh, six and seven, if you come across a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground, which young ones or eggs and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall let the mother go, but the young you may take for yourself, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long. Well, you know, that's, that's kind of the same promise as if you treat your parents with respect and honor, that you're going to live long. It's kind of the same reward type thing, you know, right here in... I mean, what, what do we say? Re respect for God's creatures? Respect for uh, animals? I can remember one time I, I saw that as a kid growing up, and I think my mom said, said you know, don't, don't touch any of them because a the mama bird might... I think the nest had gotten blown out of a tree or a bush or something. And because, uh, you know, the, the mama bird might not come back. And I remember one time mowing the lawn... And I was mowing under a huge snowball bush we had. And when I lifted it up, there was just a little, a little hole in the ground and like, I don't know how many, at least four, probably more baby bunnies. They haven't even come out yet. But the mother, we'd seen the mother all the time. Mother stayed in the front yard, ran around every afternoon. And, uh, but, you know, it's like, mm, just put that right back and get the lawnmower away from there for a while. So, and then sure enough, later on, yeah, they all came out after a few weeks. So, um, but I mean, respect for God's creation. Um, also, maybe, I don't know, you, you hear stories sometimes, and maybe you knew of some kids were mean to animals. I don't know. There's no way I'm pulling a tail of a cat or a dog. I mean, I guess at the time when I was little, my first encounter with a dog was a German Shepherd, and it wasn't a good one. And it's like, <laughs> uh, there's no way. I'm not messing with the animals. And then there was, I don't know, some joke. You know, you give the animals plenty of, plenty of space, and they won't kill you. So, you know, same thing. It's don't get too close to the bison. And uh, I saw a guy at Yellowstone chasing a bear one time. I thought, how do you mind? You know, it's like one afternoon. We were driving through the Tetons, and it's like, all these people out, we knew they found something. Sure enough, it was a bear. And he doesn't take out running after the bear. 
I'm thinking, what are you going to do? You I don't know. I don't know. That's why I was staying back, but I was kind of wanting to see, well, what happens here? Bear turns around and we'll see who's boss. But, the dog will talk the bus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, one thing I like about this little section, and there's several other places like this too, where it almost suggests, you know, leave it undisturbed at certain points, which mm -hmm. is almost sort of like, you know, don't interfere with the, with the natural way things ought to be. Yeah. You know, don't disrupt. Yeah. I mean, it's respect for creation, and then even beyond that, it's the idea of there's just a way things ought to be. And yeah. you should not get in between yeah. the mother and the chicks, right. and and if you do, you're you know that's just like I mean like you made a great analogy to the honor your father and mother. It's like when you dishonor your parents, one of the things you're doing is you're really challenging the fundamental order of how things ought to be, right? Yeah. You know, we respect God as our Father and our Creator, and He we respect Him because He is God, because He is in a superior role to us. We also respect our parents because they are in a superior role to us. They brought us into the world and they're responsible for our upbringing and for our sustenance and all those things for so many years. And this is in the same way saying, this is the way it's supposed to be. Don't put your hand down in that nest and get between the mother and the, the, yeah. the eggs or the mother and the chicks, you know, and all that. So, yeah. You know. yeah, I appreciate you saying that because that's, that's a point I was trying to make. You know, there's a social order, whether it's, of, of the way, you know, of nature or of society with, with the way we're governed and our laws and yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's just, it, it's just like, it's just like being respectful yeah. and, but it, it's on different levels. You know, if, if you get pulled over, do what the police officer says, <laughs> you know, I mean, you may not like it, even if you made the mistake and you did it, okay, but it's like, you know, everything that you come across in life is not your fight for your right. You know, it's just, I don't, I don't know. It's we, just... You know, there's also maybe think of, we go through our minds now, maybe think of uh, in Job when God speaks and says, you know, do you hear, do you hear the animals cry out when they're hungry? Do you make sure that they're fed? You know, and all just the, how beautiful and you know all of that is. I mean, all of Job has wonderful language about of thinking about God in God in ways that we should think of, about God. But when God speaks about Himself, and He says, "Oh, Job, do you know? Do you know how this really works?" You know, and yeah. of course, we are like Job. We don't know. Yeah. You know maybe Job probably knew better than we do. But yeah, you know. How that reminds me when you said that. It's like. Uh, a couple of days ago, I don't know, maybe it was last week, there were two wrecks on Interstate 40 as you go into Nashville. And I'm, we're out there on Charlotte Pike. I'm sitting in traffic, line of traffic, you know, as far as you can see. And there's, I don't know, some dead animal on the road. And the buzzards can't eat because of all the traffic, <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, well, boys, y'all going to have to wait a while. But we, you know, and there's like, eight or 12 just over here and they're just like ready as soon as and uh but anyway we didn't weren't giving them a good breakfast um let's see got a couple laws on building codes um verse eight when you build a new house you shall make a parapet for your roof that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it um, again, like you mentioned, here's one of these thrown in. Um, I, I would think, uh, I guess their roofs back then, I guess they went on top of their roofs maybe just like we might a sun deck if we had one. We don't really go on our roofs, but they did. And I guess they needed some type of railing or fencing or some buttress or something to make sure nobody fell off or, or fell through it or uh, and then you'd be responsible for that. Right, you'd be responsible. So, um, today we would just, you know, there, would, there wouldn't be anything like that without a railing of some kind. Because um, you, can, you can get in problems if you don't have enough railing or a ramp up your house if you need one uh, for wheelchairs. But, uh, 
Let's see. Okay. Next verse here, you shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed, lest the whole yield be forfeited. The crop that you have sown and the yield of the vineyard, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. You shall make yourself tassels on the four corners of the garment with which you cover yourself. Um, those first two, I don't know from, well, from my grandfather, I don't know why you'd ever want to mix your animals when you're plowing. He, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know that much about it, but I know he would never do anything like that. I've heard enough and seen enough to know that. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe the other nations around them did that they were going to be coming to, uh, and they were just supposed to be different, seen, seen differently. Maybe the animals wouldn't get along. One might pull one direction, one might pull another. I don't know. Maybe it's not good for that. Um, as far as wearing of different types of cloth together, again, I, I don't know uh, much about the reasoning on that, if anybody's got any ideas. But um, on the tassels, Uh, yeah, just, I mean, I, I don't know, is that? Who they are. Okay. All right. You know, Rhett, uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, there's that famous verse that Paul quotes from the Old Testament about not being unequally yoked. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, and basically that's about God's people, God doesn't want his people yoked with people of the world mm -hmm. in inappropriate yeah. relationships. Various sorts. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting on, on that. You know, we we think usually of marriage, and I was talking to somebody one time about you know, he was telling me he said would never go into business with anybody who wasn't a a Christian or yeah. believe, and you know, as far as being a partner or anything where it's a, a legal type thing of a. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, that's something to think about. And, and to go back to God make. God being a God of distinctions, you know, in the Old Testament we read that uh, God forbade the people of Israel from intermarrying. Mm -hmm. Even in heterosexual uh, relationships, they could do. It wasn't about race; it was about uh, the pagan religions of yeah. the people. Right. God, God wanted the distinctions of His people maintained. Mm -hmm. he, again, He didn't want those lines blurred. And that may be what's going on when God forbids the wearing of mixed cloth. Okay. God, God gave the people tangible visual aids for them to remember the importance of purity, the importance of not blurring things. And whereas the people of the other nations might have done that, mixed it up, and just with their clothing like that? Possible? Well, uh, that's possible. Yeah. And I also just, just each time they wore a cloth, a piece of clothing of a single material, they could have that as a visual aid where God's people we're, we're to not be mixed okay. inappropriately with the people of the world to okay. worship those foreign uh, pagan idols. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, that last verse about the tassels, uh, as you mentioned, that would make a distinction and show who they were. Um, I did have a reference, though, about when the woman reached out to touch Jesus, and or at least... I think the word there is him, but it might also mean fringe. And one of these tassels might have been connected to that. And um, I, I don't know. I guess what I thought was interesting, that's something I hadn't really thought of, that it connected back to Deuteronomy. And I guess just all the things I've ever seen of, of Jesus, it's always been a white type of garment. And it hasn't had anything fancy around it. But then if, he, if he's wearing what he would wear as a Jew, then it would have those things. And uh, I also got a, there's a note in the study Bible I'm using. It's Numbers 15, and this passage shows you do this. It says, 
speak to the Israelites and tell them to make for themselves tassels on the hems of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a blue cord on the tassel of the hem, you will have a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commands of Yahweh, and do them, and not follow after the unfaithfulness of your own heart and eyes, so that you will remember and do all my commandments, and you will be holy for your God, and Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land. So in that, it sounds like also the tassel is kind of like a like tying a string around your finger, you know, to remind you about, uh, don't forget the covenant, don't forget the commandments and all that. So I, I don't know if it's a relation it yeah. relates to that. Well, and I know I had, uh, looking in my notes, Matthew 23, 5. Um, let's see if I can see it here. Matthew 23, 5. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, mm -hmm. and they love the place of honor at feast and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. So it's almost like it was to draw attention to them, more so than just to keep God's laws or commands. It also says that what God is what God has required, I can exaggerate. Right. I can make it better. Make it better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Can you go back to the wool and linen for a second? It's interesting. It's, it's not that wool's bad or linen's bad. It's just you shouldn't sew them together, basically. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's like it's fine if you're wearing wool and it's fine if you're wearing yeah. linen. Just don't have like a patch of wool and a patch of linen. And they're really are for different seasons of the year. Right. Yeah. Right. Wool is winter. Yeah. And, I, and I don't know, in my mind, I just thought, well, maybe they had one that was linen and then one of wool thrown on over it or something. I, I don't know. See, I, I didn't know how to picture that, really. Um, but it, you must have been able to see the difference, though. Yeah. So it was visible. Um, Um, well, I didn't get very far at all. So, uh, let's see. <laughs> well, I don't know if we want to stay that long for that. Um, but I will, I will do some thinking about it and see where we're going to pick up next week. Okay. okay? <laughs> You said I, you cover everything. That's yeah. right. That's right. Twenty-one through twenty-six, but we wouldn't get everything. Um, <laughs> so anyway, and it is—I'll tell you—it is difficult to pick and choose too. It, it, is. it is difficult because I feel like okay, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of sermons in here, but more than I wanna I wanna give, and uh, especially to you on a Wednesday night. Uh, I hope that we've at least been able to look at it and think about it and hopefully you're uh, you've been challenged in some way to either continue reading or um, I don't know I found that I've just enjoyed reading it more than I thought I would just reading it even though I'm certainly don't not an authority on this um, but anyway let's see I'm going to Gray, if you would, would you lead us in prayer before yes. we're dismissed? Yes. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, you are so great and so good. And Lord, we are so grateful for uh, the literature of the Bible, um, the way that you have crafted um, this work through your servants and through your Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, let us delight in it. Uh, let us meditate upon it. savor it uh, and to discuss it and to uh, fall deeper uh, in love with you and in your service. Lord, we just uh, pray blessings on, on uh, Rhett for his work, uh, for preparing the lessons for us, and uh, a blessing on everyone who is here tonight, um, and blessings for us until we return um, Sunday. We thank you for all these things, and in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you. Thank you for being here and be careful on the way home. Have a good rest of the week.
Well, Sherry said, you think he mows the yard in his suit? Yeah, that's right. I wonder. Did you know my grandfather, our grandmother? That's what he would do. He would use his old suit. Uh -huh. And he would just, because he never threw anything away. So, and he had, he had his old suits that had a paint splash on them. He's over the yard and he he just went into, he got a new suit, the uh, old suit, and went into his work clothes and ran his suit. Yeah. It's just funny. From that era, it's just like, yeah. You know, the only thing was, the only thing was. So if you didn't need to feed the sunshine, you would be just doing hospital, I guess, to throw it in the That's right. Walking yeah. our mother, for example. We all had great grandparents, so I don't want to be able to help so well. Well, the, the scarcity of the depression and also just the lack of mass production. Yeah. yeah.
See, for me, 